Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce a Renaissance man, and I use that term very infrequently. In fact, this may be the first time I've ever used it after interviewing hundreds of people over the past 30 or so years. Uh, but Professor Ken Elzinger uh, fits that, and when you hear his bio, I think he'll probably agree with me. In addition to being a professor, he's a hot rod enthusiast, and he writes murder mystery novels. He, uh, in fact, but they're so good that they're required reading at some colleges and universities. So his daytime job is the Robert C. Taylor Professor of Economics at the University of Virginia. He's also an antitrust expert. And uh, his expertise in antitrust law led to a US Supreme Court decision that minimum retail pricing schemes formally treated as automatically illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act may offer benefits to consumers. Uh, the lawyers in this room can decipher that later. But Professor Elzinga's academic career began with his bachelor's from Kalamazoo College in Michigan. He went on to earn his PhD from Michigan State. His career has spanned over 50 years of teaching. He currently holds a distinguished chair at the University of Virginia uh, he was the first winner of the UVA's Cavalier Distinguished Teaching Professorship. This next st statistic is mind-blowing. He's taught almost 50,000 students over 50 years of teaching. Somewhere along the line, he found time to guest lecture at Wheaton's International Study Program in the 1970s. I was uh, one of those students. In fact, one of my fellow classmates gave me some slides. When you, when, uh, for those of you under the age of about 30, uh, this is the original slide. It's not these things on the, on the screen. But it shows a Professor Elzinga teaching, uh, presumably my class, in 1978 in Holland. Now, uh, students, especially my students, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit, I don't remember a word he said. But not because of his lack of teaching skills, but because of my lack of listening. That's where I was in 1978. Here's what Florida State's Stavros Center called Dr. Elzinga, probably the nation's most successful teacher of college level economics. That's a quote. Some of his classes have a two year waiting list. So those of you here at Wheaton who get upset for maybe a few weeks waiting list or maybe a semester, imagine waiting for two years. His expertise is vast and include areas as diverse as airline deregulation, cartels, predatory pricing, and even the beer industry. He's won the UVA Alumni Association's Distinguished Professor Award, the Commonwealth of Virginia's Outstanding Faculty Award, and in 1992, he received the highest honor that UVA can bestow upon a faculty member, the Thomas Jefferson Award. He's also active in several Christian ministries, makes a point of hosting students to his home around Thanksgiving. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my privilege and honor to introduce my friend, my former professor, and my brother in Christ, Professor Ken Elzinga. <laughs> While he's coming up, the questions will be sent to Slido at 582029, and I will read the most popular questions. Thank you, David, for a very, very kind introduction. Um, let me say something a little bit off script for me. Um, <clears throat> it's a real treat to be here at Wheaton College. And I say that not as a cliche, but um, as something that's very genuine for me. I have believed that my calling, calling, not just a career, but my calling has been to be at a public secular university. But when I come to a Christian college like Wheaton, there's a sense in which I feel liberated where I feel like I can be who I really am as a Christian scholar. I don't look at Wheaton with envy, because I know that's wrong, but I have a certain, um, not sure what the Christian word for envy is, but a, um, a certain admiration for what goes on at, uh, at this school. It's very important that schools like this be part of the educational landscape of, uh, of the United States. If you do much public speaking or if you attend a lot of public lectures, you'll know that it's almost a cliche for the person to say, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. 
Now, usually when a speaker says that, that's a total fabrication. The person would rather be home reading a book or on the beach. But in my case, it really is a pleasure to be here. I've had an opportunity to speak to uh, two classes today. That was really fun uh, to give a talk uh, at a Bill Pollard appreciation dinner. And now to give this lecture. Um, David talked about some of my credentials, but you might be wondering what credentials do I have to give a talk with this particular title? So in what lawyers call full disclosure, <clears throat> let me mention a couple items that at least will involve partial disclosure. So this is a slide of two books by Lewis, <clears throat> Mere Christianity and God in the Dock. The writings of C.S. Lewis, particularly these two books, Mere Christianity and the Essays in God in the Dock, were very important in my own conversion to the Christian faith while I was in graduate school. And ever since, I've had an interest in Lewis. I visited his rooms at Oxford University. I've walked Addison's Walk, where he would meet with Tolkien, and then these other places, the Wade Center. I've done research there, and I just think, wow, how cool is it for Wheaton College to have the Wade Center? That's amazing. I would love to have something like that in Charlottesville. And then there's the Eagle and Child, the pub where Lewis met with the Inklings. I've visited that pub. Some of you probably have been there as well. And then I've been to Lewis's home, uh, the Kilns in Oxford. And then this is kind of an odd picture. It's a picture of a bookshelf in my library that has all of the books I have about C.S. Lewis, either by him or about him. I'm prone to purchase just about any book that comes out about Lewis. Query, do I have a book on Lewis that merits being in the Wade collection? Maybe so. Let me show you this one here, C.S. Lewis, Images of His World by Douglas Gilbert and Clyde Kilby. Many of you in this audience would know that Kilby was a professor of English at Wheaton College. <clears throat> and Gilbert was at one time on the art faculty. This book is now almost 50 years old. No doubt the Wade collection holds the book, but it might, might not hold one like mine. Look at this next slide. Mine is autographed by both Kilby and Gilbert. I hope someday that this book will make its way to the Wade collection. I don't consider myself a Lewis scholar, but I'm more than an admirer. Let's put me in the category of someone who takes Lewis seriously. So here's the pedagogical format. I'm going to lecture, and I hope to leave some time for questions at the end, OK? I'm going to make two contentions. The first is that the philosophy of C.S. Lewis, who is believed by many to be the premier Christian apologist of the 20th century, fits comfortably within what Adam Smith, the founder of the discipline of economics, called the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. In fact, I'm going to argue that the Christian faith, as espoused and defended by Lewis, is an ally of free market conservatives and libertarians against the Leviathan state. And my second contention is that if you dig into Lewis's writings, if you really drill down into their foundation in the life and teachings of Jesus, one continues to find a theology <clears throat> that squares with Adam Smith's obvious and simple system of natural liberty. Now these are portmanteau expressions. And they require unpacking. And I don't have a lot of time to unpack them in detail. So if you have a seat belt, you should fashion it because we're gonna move quickly. And let's start with Lewis himself. In 1943, <clears throat> during the height of World War II, Lewis was asked for his views on democracy. And at the time he was teaching at Oxford, as well as speaking to student and military groups and recording talks that were broadcast for the morale of the soldiers. And these were talks, it's hard to understand this even in today's culture in particular, these were talks that explained the elements of the Christian faith and that would later become the basis for Lewis's famous description and defense of the Christian faith, the book that I put up earlier, Mere Christianity, a book that profoundly, profoundly affected me when I was in graduate school. Now because England was locked in a desperate struggle with the totalitarian regime of Nazi Germany, Many assume that when Lewis gave his views on democracy, he would offer a flag-waving, ringing affirmation of democracy in general and of Great Britain in particular. But this was not the case. Let me put on the screen a portion of what Lewis wrote. I am a Democrat, small d Democrat, 
because I believe in the fall of man. I think most people are Democrats for the opposite reason. A great deal of democratic enthusiasm descends from the ideas of people like Rousseau, who believed in democracy because they thought mankind so wise and good that everyone deserved a share in the government. The danger of defending democracy on those grounds is they're not true. I find that they're not true without looking further than myself. I don't deserve a share in governing a hen roost, we would say a chicken coop, much less a nation, nor do most people. The real reason for democracy is just the reverse. Mankind is so fallen that no man can be trusted with unchecked power over his fellows. Aristotle said that some people were only fit to be slaves. I do not contradict him, but I reject slavery because I see no men fit to be masters. So Lewis's point here is that in a fallen world, democracy is our best option for governing, not only because men shouldn't be servants, but because no one is fit to be a master. His reflections on government and authority echo that of Lord Acton's observation that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I'm not sure what this says about me, but over the course of my over 50 years in Charlottesville as a professor, I have been approached by three political parties asking me if I was interested in running for Congress in our area, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Libertarian Party. When C.S. Lewis was approached by men with similar political ambitions for him, he proposed and I think this may have been with tongue in cheek, the creation of an entirely new political party. Let's see what Lewis wrote. Could one start a stagnation party, which at general elections would boast that during its term of office, no event of the least importance had taken place? Now, C.S. Lewis had no training in economics that I know of, but his views on what he believed to be the fallen nature of man left him uncomfortable when men were given control over the lives and property of others. He viewed limited government as a necessary evil. And he was quick to point out that the hum for the human condition, government was medicine, it was not food. Let's look at this very profound quote and note the strain of libertarianism within it. I want to focus on those first four words of all the tyrannies. And I want to stop there a moment. He's not just saying among the tyrannies, of all the tyrannies. This is connected to another expression Lewis had that really got my attention in an essay on the inner ring that appears in the book, The Weight of Glory. In that essay, Lewis starts, of all the passions, of all the passions the passion for the inner ring is most skillful at making a man who is not yet a very bad man do very bad things. That really got my attention because in the academic world, as in many worlds, there are these inner rings. Now here Lewis says, of all the tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Think about that for a moment. And Lewis goes on to explain that seemingly odd statement it may be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. Why is that? The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. To be cured against one's will and cured of states which we may not regard as a disease is to be put on a level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason or those who never will, to be classed with infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals. Now, Friedrich Hayek, <clears throat> a Nobel Prize winner in my field of economics, wrote about what he famously called the fatal conceit, the fatal conceit, which Hayek understood to be the taproot of central planning. Lewis came to the same conclusion that the promises of central planning were a fatal conceit but he came to this from a very, very different angle, centering his observation on the book of Genesis and the Reformation doctrine of the fallen nature of man, Lewis wrote these words. All that can really happen, and he's referring to socialism here, 
is that some men will take charge of the destiny of others. They will, simply, they will be simply men, none perfect, some greedy, cruel, and dishonest. The more completely we are planned, the more powerful they will be. Have we discovered some new reason why this time power should corrupt as it had not done before? Shades again of Lord Acton. In writing about the welfare state, Lewis was as blunt as any free market conservative or libertarian and is 180 degrees opposite of a politician on the progressive left. Look at this quote. Oops. The question has become whether we can discover any way of submitting to the worldwide paternalism of a technocracy without losing all personal privacy and independence. Is there any possibility of getting the welfare state's honey and avoiding the sting? Let us make no mistake about the sting. To live his life in his own way, to call his home his castle, to enjoy the fruits of his own labor, to educate his children as his conscience directs, to save for their prosperity after his death, these are wishes deeply ingrained in civilized man. Now note closely Lewis's words here. He is not writing of the benefits of a free society for the elites, the type of students that he taught at Oxford and Cambridge. He's not writing about the benefits of a free society for his illustrious literary friends like J.R.R. Tolkien and Dorothy Sayers. Lewis is writing about ordinary Englishmen, four ordinary Englishmen who would not be studying at Oxford or Cambridge or be engaged in the writing of books. As a Christian, as one who viewed all men as created in God's image and therefore of great value, Lewis wanted for ordinary people a world in which their home was their castle, where the fruits of their labor, however modest, would not be taxed away, and where their children were seen as theirs to raise in accord with their conscience and not the state's, and where inheritance were seen as property to be protected by the state <clears throat> not confiscated by the state. I'm going to put this slide up of a picture with Lewis and the word freeborn. Lewis, to my knowledge, and I may be corrected on this, never used the word libertarian or conservative to describe an ideology. As an extraordinary wordsmith, and that he was, Lewis probably would not have liked the terms. As a follower of Jesus, Lewis thought more in biblical taxonomy he did, however, use the term freeborn, freeborn. He wrote these words, I believe a man is happy, happier, and happy in a richer way if he had the freeborn mind. But I doubt whether he can have this without economic independence, for economic independence allows an education not controlled by government. <clears throat> and an adult life, and in adult life, it is the man who needs and asks nothing of the government who can criticize its acts and snap his fingers at its ideology. Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, became all the rage among the political left. Finally, they thought someone had made a data-dense, clinically dispassionate case for government-sponsored, government-mandated economic equality, an economic case for higher tax rates on the wealthy to make the poor less poor. I think Lewis would have seen through this in a minute. He wrote these words. When equality is treated not as a medicine or a safety gadget, but as an ideal, but as an ideal, we begin to breed that stunted and envious state of mind which hates all superiority. That mind is the special disease of democracy. It will kill us all if it grows unchecked. And then Lewis added, every intrusion of the spirit that says, I'm as good as you, into our personal and spiritual life is to be resisted as every intrusion of bureaucracy or privilege into our politics. And then Lewis wrote this, God's love for us is not measured by our social rank or our intellectual talents. If there is to be equality, it is in his love not in us. Everyone in Wheaton is familiar with this picture. 
I had the privilege of being a friend and co-teacher for a while with Bob Bartell, who taught here at Westmont King College. Bob was the person, as some of you know, who at an auction on behalf of Wheaton College bid enough against Walter Hooper to get this wardrobe to come to the Wade Center. It was one of Bob's great contributions to, uh, to Wheaton College. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a scene in which the Pevensey children have become the king and queen. And Lewis describes their kingdom this way. And they made good laws and kept the peace and generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. <clears throat> Now, Lewis never pretended to be an economist, but he knew that economic utopias of the sort that bedeviled the 20th century had a disturbing propensity either to fail or require enforcement at the point of a gun. And Lewis also understood that no economic system would produce heaven on earth. While many of Lewis's academic counterparts in the humanities were attracted to Rousseau and the natural goodness of man, Lewis believed in the fall of Adam and the expulsion from the garden. And like a good economist, Lewis understood that poverty, not prosperity, was the natural order of things. <clears throat> a singer named Frank Sinatra had a famous theme song entitled, My Way. And if you're a student at Wheaton College and you're in this audience and you have no idea who Frank Sinatra is, he once was as big as the Beatles. And if you don't know who the Beatles are, they once were as big as Beyonce. Now consider the two words that comprise the title of Frank Sinatra's theme song, My Way. And think about two of the most famous words of Jesus, follow me. My way, follow me. A really stark contrast. Frank Sinatra sings my way, but the Bible teaches, if I may use some King James language, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Or in a more modern translation, there is a way, note that word way again, that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. The scriptures of the Christian faith don't square with the philosophy of my way. I'll just put up two slides to illustrate that. <clears throat> Proverbs 19.21, Proverbs 16.9. The promotion of ourselves, the pursuit of our own desires, the I did it my way spirit embodied in the Frank Sinatra song can run rampant in a free market. So what's then the problem with free market capitalism? Certainly not that it doesn't deliver the goods, it does that. And certainly not that it requires greed because it doesn't. When G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton was asked, what's wrong with the world? He replied, I am, I'm what's wrong. And like Chesterton, whom Lewis admired, Lewis would have recognized that what's wrong with the market system is that it's populated with people like us, people who come to believe that it's by our might and by our power that things are accomplished. And here's the rub. Because the market system is such an extraordinary engine of economic abundance for so many, not for all, but for so many. There are all too many who can be deluded into thinking, I did this. And into this ostensibly libertarian proposition comes the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it claims that freedom is to be found in following Jesus. Now, many of my students at UVA are very puzzled over this. They wonder, how could following someone else lead to my freedom? And the answer would be never, unless, unless the person you're following holds the key to an abundant life. And that's one of the claims of Jesus. I tell my students, he said, I have come that you can have life more abundantly. Now, I want to ask a rhetorical question that came to me when I was working on this talk. Did you ever think about how remarkable is the name Adam Smith? According to the Bible, Adam was the first man. And then Smith is the most common, the most common surname in the English language. 
So in, and, and Adam Smith, a man named Adam Smith, writes the most famous book about economics, and it's about the economic flourishing, not of kings and potentates, and not about religious and political authorities, but about how ordinary people, the Smiths of the world, might prosper through what Smith, Adam Smith called the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. The strength and the weakness of Adam Smith's obvious and simple system of natural liberty are two sides of the same coin. It's the strength of how free markets improve our standard of living in a fashion that is freedom compatible. When Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, the experience of most people over the whole span of mankind was one of grinding, hopeless poverty. Many of my students don't understand that. There was not a golden age of prosperity at some point. And it was poverty with no relief and poverty with no expectation of improvement. And Smith decided to explore and explain the aberrations. How did some nations manage to escape this fate? And hence the full title of Adam Smith's masterpiece, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. But the other side of the coin, the other side of the coin is that the free market makes no promise of changed hearts for common people. A free society allows human virtues to be exercised, but a free society by definition cannot mandate changed hearts. So libertarians and free market conservatives care about freedom, as does the Christian faith. Consider the words of Jesus, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. These are found in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 32. Here's a slide of a very prominent building at the institution where I teach, the University of Virginia. It's Cabell Hall, one of the most prominent buildings on the grounds of the university. Um, the words that can be seen engraved on the <clears throat> upon the front of Cabell Hall, they're in Greek, um, are in the many, many colleges and universities around the United States. The truth shall set you free is an expression that seems to be very fitting for any academic setting. What would separate Christians from many libertarians and what would give Lewis pause about mainstream libertarianism is what happens when you put those famous words of Jesus in context. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free is the tail end of the expression that's often put on buildings at colleges and universities. The front end rarely gets inscribed. But Jesus began by saying, if you abide in my word and you're truly my disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Lewis understood and believed something that would be a hard pill to swallow for anyone who conflates liberty with doing their own thing. The paradox of the Christian gospel is that we are most free when we are doing what we were created to do. And therein, in my view, lies the rub between Jesus and many libertarians. Libertarians believe in freedom, but it's a freedom from guidelines, from control, from anything that stands in one's way of one's desires and pursuits. They wanna be in control of their own lives. The poem Invictus has a famous part that goes like this. And just as an aside, I remember a very sweet student of mine from England who thought she was going to capture my attention by putting this poem in a, in a, in a paper she was writing on economics. And I, I said to her, you know, that's one of the most anti-Christian poems that's ever been written. She was astonished at that. But think of this language. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And for students for whom these words stir their cocoa, they balk at the metaphor of abiding in God's word or the idea of following Jesus. So what we have here is an age old divide that goes back to the beginning of recorded history. It goes back to the story of Adam and Eve. It's a question of authority. Whose authority are we under? And it's also a question of freedom. Is freedom to be valued? Libertarians, free market conservatives would say yes. If only the government would leave us alone, make our own decisions, voluntarily trade with other people. 
But the purpose of that freedom, this is the fork in the road for libertarians who are secular, and most of them are by my observation, and those who are not. The secular libertarian says the purpose is what I want to make it to be. I want to be the captain of my soul. And the person who's a follower of Jesus says something quite different. This person says, I've been created for something higher and something better than my own desires. And true freedom comes from doing what God has called me to do. One of the reasons I like this verse from 1 Peter, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. What I try to explain to my students is that what sets the freedom of Jesus and I would contend the freeborn concept of C.S. Lewis, what sets this apart from freedom as construed and written about by people like Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Murray Rothbard, is that freedom in Christ is freedom from bondage, not bondage to the state, but bondage to sin. The Christian gospel cannot be well understood without understanding the Old Testament scriptures. And let me say as a sidebar here, when I flew up yesterday, I took a book with me by uh, Ed Clowney <clears throat> called Preaching Christ in All of Scripture. Um, Ed was a beloved pastor of mine for a number of years in Charlottesville when he was scholar in residence at our church. Um, he was formerly president of Westminster Seminary, but he's a Wheaton grad how proud this institution should be to have produced a man like Ed Clowney. Um, Ed understood that you really uh, captured the riches of the gospel, not just from the New Testament, from the Old Testament as well. And the Old Testament has two accounts that would have been very familiar to C.S. Lewis. The first is the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt by God's miraculous, miraculous provision. For an Israelite living under the rule of Pharaoh would be a libertarian's nightmare. And God thought it was a nightmare too. So he delivered the Israelites from bondage, chalk one up for freedom. But the second is the giving of the law, the 10 commandments. And this also involved the liberation of the people of Israel, but in a very different fashion. The exodus from Egypt meant freedom from slavery, but the giving of the law meant freedom for something greater freedom from bondage to sin. And Lewis would argue that becoming followers of Jesus is not to our, deny our identity as individuals, rather it is to complete our identity. This connection that's lost in Eden gets regained. The Narnia tales capture that so eloquently. And when the shackles of sin are removed for from our ankles, then we're free to rise up and go forth and follow Jesus as Lord. Who is freer than the person who chooses to serve? Probably everyone here knows that Lewis became a Christian after he was a famous scholar. He was, as he described himself, a reluctant convert. And writing about his coming to faith, he didn't use the word liberty, but he did use the word liberation. Lewis wrote, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men and God's compulsion is our liberation. Wow, there's a lot to unpack in that. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and God's compulsion is our liberation. The Christian gospel tells us what to do with that liberation. It's not the poem Invictus. It's not Sinatra's My Way. It is rather to know God and enjoy him forever, to love God and to love our neighbors. I've quoted Lewis a lot in this talk. Let me close by quoting something from Father Robert Sirico of the Acton Institute. <clears throat> he wrote words that I think are very Lewisian. When freedom is divorced from faith, both freedom and faith suffer. Freedom becomes rudderless because the truth gives freedom its direction. I'll read that again. When freedom is divorced from faith, both freedom and faith suffer. Freedom becomes rudderless because the truth gives freedom its directions. Where does the truth come from? The Christian faith has the answer to that. It comes from the life and teachings of Jesus. 
who had the temerity to say, along with the authority to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for your attention. It's a treat to be here where I think of as Lewis's American home, and I'm told there'll be some time for Q&A, so David, I'll let you take over on that. Thank you.